Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm so glad you tuned in to the third in our Majesty of Birds series. We're calling it Birds of Prey. And I've got your favorite guy here, Russ Kerr, professional photographer. Also, a guy who's been a volunteer naturalist with the Upper Newport Bay Ecological Reserve. Did I get that right, Russ? Welcome. Yes, you did. <laughs> I did. I stumbled over a little bit. I'll say it again. The Upper Newport Bay Ecological Reserve. Uh, you spent a lot of time there, brother. I also volunteered naturalist at the uh, Discovery Center up at Big Bear Lake. Oh, that's right. And that's a beautiful place to visit. Let's encourage people to go there. Uh, it, it really is. But you lived in a beautiful part of the world, Russ, and <clears throat> you found that uh, you enjoyed those visits the most to uh, that that uh, back bay in your neighborhood when you had a fine camera in your hand. I t just tell us how it all got started. I didn't really do much photography till I moved to the near the back bay in 1990. But I would walk along the bluff and these hawks would just float by on yes. the up, updraft from the cliffs. <laughs> and uh. I was trying to take pictures of them with a... Uh, with a film roll <laughs> or the manual focus. Yes. I take a picture, try to focus it, and then I have to push the lever one more time to advance the film and the bird's gone. <laughs> <clears throat> so Canon was just coming out with their autofocus equipment. It was predictive autofocus. Yes. So I, I spent the money and got a really nice um, professional camera, nine frames a second. Well, let's jump right in, Russ. Let's start with that very first <laughs> photograph. Tell us what we're looking at. <clears throat> this is the, the light morph red-tailed hawk, probably the most common hawk in the United States. And this is the most typical one version that you see. It has um, a dark, the inner wing has a dark uh, lining on it. Yeah, and that leading edge. Yes. And so that's diagnostic for a, a red-tailed hawk, if you see that uh, dark inner edge on the wing leading. And then for the adult, you do have a red tail that's very visible mm -hmm. when it's backlit, um, yeah. as you see here. But they normally have a dark head, kind of a light chest, and then with spots across the chest, like and, you see here. And that look he's giving us means business. <clears throat> yeah, I was hiking, and he <laughs> was in a tree in front of me that I didn't even see, but I always carry the camera in my hands ready to shoot and he just flew right over me and I got him. Wow, what a great shot. But um, the red tail hawk is in a group of birds of prey called Budios and these are hawks with broad wings and wide tails and it just allows them to soar for hours uh, up in the air. Mm. I'll show you another picture of the red tail hawk. This is front lit and you don't nearly see as much right. red as when it's backlit. <clears throat> but again, you see the dark leading edge on the inside and then the light chest and the dark head. They come in a few different morphs. This is towards a rufous morph. Um, you can see all that rufous color. But again, the leading edge inside <clears throat> close to the body is dark. It also comes in a dark morph and the adult, easy to tell with a red tail. And this would be the juvenile. The juvenile does not have a red tail the first year, but again, it has the dark um, leading edge of the inner wings mm. and then uh, some faint striping across the tail. But the birds of prey, they say that 90% of them never make it to their first year. Wow. So every time I see a juvenile, I kind of <laughs> <laughs> clap my hands and, and... A survivor. Yes. He hasn't made... The second year yet, but it looks like he's on his way. Hmm. So here's a pair. Um, the female is usually larger on the left and the male on the right. And they're going to pair up and make a nest. <clears throat> Often they uh, fly around with their legs hanging down, kind of a, a courtship flight together. And so when they decide to mate, um, off they go to make a nest and here's mom or dad bringing like a young ground squirrel oh, up yeah. to the nest. I see that. 
uh, flying up to the nest in the tree that you'll see in a minute. This is a red-tailed hawk that's uh, getting banded, <clears throat> but you can just see the feathers are almost full length, and uh, he's starting to get the dark edge on the inner wing there. Okay, just, this is a nest in Irvine, California, um, right in the middle of suburbia. Wow. And there's um, three chicks, or three juveniles. There's two in the nest, and this is probably the firstborn that's uh, a little bit further along and stronger. But if you notice the crop, um, just below his throat, there's this big bulge. And that's where, when he eats his food, that's where it's stored until oh. it, it can be digested. So when you see a big crop on a juvenile, you know that the parents are doing a good job feeding him. But he's practicing building up his flight muscles out there, flapping into the wind. And pretty soon he'll be able to leave the nest. And here he is when he left the nest, and the juveniles seem to have this nice cream color at the top of their, just below their throat. Mm. But again, you see the dark marks on the leading edge of the inner wing, and then the striped tail because it's a juvenile. And here's one out hunting, which is good in his first year to be able to hunt for himself. That's what you always hope for. So when the nest was over, I go down and uh, collect all the stuff at the bottom of the nest. And this is one more out <laughs> of the, the leftovers, out in the field or the grasslands, and see it's mostly snakes and rabbits. And mm. I think there's a king snake second from the right yeah. side. And the other one must be a gopher snake or a rattlesnake or something large. Mm. Then there was another one more in suburbia, and there's some ground squirrels, a rabbit. And then a banded pigeon that never made it back home. <laughs> okay, another uh, bootio um, is the red-shouldered hawk. And it's aptly named. You can see the, the red on the shoulder of the wings. But they're just a beautiful bird. And so we got to be friends, so I asked them to turn around so I could <laughs> show you the backside. And uh, so it has a lot well, of... who wouldn't show that off? <clears throat> Had a lot of checkering and, and stripes wow. on the tail. And then as I talked about my earlier ventures of trying to do a, a, a bird in flight, most of them came out like this uh, with a manual mm. focus and, yeah. <laughs> and one, one I got frame. Some, I've got some of those. But then with the, all this autofocus that's so good, uh, it just comes into sharp wow. focus. And usually one out of the nine uh, or several out of the nine are very much in focus. But again, you see the red shoulder on the left wing there, and then uh, just the beautiful coloring. This is up in the air, and when I first, when I was learning how to identify these hawks, I asked someone, how do you tell a red shouldered hawk? And he just said, uh, checkered. And you can just see all the checkering on the wings, and so when they're overhead, they look quite checkered. And that helped me to identify yeah. them. And you'll notice near the wingtips, um, th there's some white there. <clears throat> and if you see it high up in the air and you don't get your binoculars in time, well, recently I saw one just with my glasses uh, mm -hmm. up high, but you could see the, yeah. the, the crescent shape um, at the base of the primary feathers there to identify a red-shouldered hawk. They eat quite a variety of stuff. Um, this would be a lizard that it's uh, about to devour. This would be a small rodent. Again, you see all that beautiful coloring. They will actually catch birds also. And this is, I think, a small ground squirrel that's not very big yet. So when they get together to mate, <clears throat> it's the male's job to supply all the food to the female. Mm. And so he's on the left, and he's just brought food for the female. <laughs> and he's got the message that it's time to get out of the way and, and leave it for her. <laughs> and this is that one in Irvine that um, you can see it's right by a parking structure and medical buildings. Wow. And um, so I called a friend of mine, and uh, he came and banded it. But... Um, Oh, you, you found the chick in that neighborhood, <clears throat> and they were able to find him even after you had uh, 
uh, reported him his existence there, and they came and found him. Well, I when I see birds in the neighborhood, I try to find where the nest is, mm. which I was able to do, and then I advised him, and they know they want to ban them before they can fly, so they they don't before they can jump out of the nest. So it worked. So, That's amazing. But it's kind of fun to see him in the hand. Yeah. And then this would be the juvenile. They don't have that rufous color yet, but they they do have the checkered wings if they were to spread them out and the stripes on the tail. Okay, another butio is the ferruginous hawk. <clears throat> it's the largest of the butios with about a four and a half foot wingspan, primarily in wow. open grasslands and this is up in Lancaster where they come down uh, during the winter to, to uh, agricultural fields and eat a lot of the rodents. But they have the beautiful rufous color on top and then the kind of a blue-gray feathering in the secondaries you can see. And so the juvenile be the same pose, but it doesn't have the coloring yet. Mm. But they all have that white tail. And an interesting thing is that the adults well, and the chicks or the juveniles, are feathered all the way down to their toes. But the adults have the rufous feathering all the way down to their toes. So when you, if they fly overhead, you can see that those oh. leg, legs of the rufous feathering make this mm. dark V, mm. and you'll know that that is an adult uh, ferruginous hawk. And I'll show you the juvenile overhead. They have the white feathering, so you can tell right away if it's a juvenile or an adult. But they all have that white tail and the light undersides. And to help confuse you a little bit, they also have a dark morph, mm. but with the white tail. <clears throat> Another bird of the open grasslands is um, the Swainson's hawk. And they come down here in the summer to actually breed and have nests up in the desert. But they have this white throat, which is diagnostic, usually a dark below that, and then the all the feathers on the leading edge of the wing are, are white. They also have kind of a rufous morph. This isn't all the way rufous, but it's tending that way. And they have a dark morph also. But again, they all have that white throat. And here you see it perched with a white throat uh, calling because there's a nest nearby. You can see how cryptic that juvenile is in the nest. Mm. Um, if someone was to fly over an eagle or a That's owl, camouflage. <clears throat> yeah, they'd be hard to spot. So this is the one when it's left the nest. Um, again, you see that full crop. The parents are doing a great job. And it has kind of that a little bit of rufous below the throat. And here's the juvenile perched. A lot of the juveniles have this white tips on all their feathers, so they're kind of easy to identify. And I kind of think that the white might make the flight feathers a little longer and maybe get them a better chance to fly while they're learning. This is the Harris hawk. It's a very striking hawk that's in the desert and the brush company brush country <clears throat> mostly in arizona and texas um the lower parts <clears throat> because they're down in mexico mostly but they have that beautiful coloring and in flight you can see that wow coloring again mm. and this would be a juvenile more spotty than the adult it's kind of typical the next bird is a northern harrier, sometimes called the marsh hawk in the past. <clears throat> but it, you can see it has a facial disc like an owl, so it yeah. has very acute hearing, and it primarily hunts by hearing rather than um, hmm. sight. So the female is brown and white like this. The male is white um, and gray, with a, like they dip their primary feathers in the inkwell. Oh. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, I see that. But he's kind of referred to as the white ghost. Mm. And then if you're a juvenile, you have all this beautiful uh -huh. uh, rufous color, but you always see that facial disc um, just like an owl. 
So this would be a juvenile because it's um, got the rufous color. And they have the white at the base of the tail on top, as opposed to a Cooper's hawk that you'll see in a few minutes that is white at the bottom of the tail. So their method is to just fly low and slow over the marsh um, with their wings in a slight uh, V. And they're primarily listening um, to find their prey. And when they do, they can make this very mm. sharp turn with their wings and tail. And here you can see mm. the magnificent tail that is quite a rudder to steer them to the right place. So when they do hear it, um, they'll drop down feet first, like you see this male doing, and then they'll carry it off underneath them. This would probably be a, a rail since it was in the marsh. You can see the feet hanging down. Mm. I live near the edge of the bluff, and I looked out on the green belt because it was a condo. Yeah, that's a cut lawn. And it was a, a dead uh, possum there. Mm. So I was watching it, and then in you could see a bird flying by, so I got set up. <clears throat> this would be a juvenile that came in, and so evidently they'll eat carrion or dead meat also rather than catch their own. Mm. So he's about to, to claim this, but another <laughs> harrier. <laughs> little competition. I think they're both juveniles because I see some rufus on the tails. Um, so they're going at it to see who's going to get this prize. <laughs> and they really go at it. This is a knockdown, drag out type wow, of fight. Wow, these are great shots. To, to claim who's who gets to do that. So then the victor kind of mantles his prey, uses his wings and tail to cover it up and make sure that nobody else is circling above and <laughs> is going to come and try to fight him for it. And then he'll partake of the meal and, ah, right there. and eat there. So they do some cleanup, but the king of all the cleanup is the turkey vulture. Oh, yes. They have about a five and a half foot wingspan. And wow. That's where you see them on road kills a lot, um, just cleaning up. So they look quite ugly, but they'll kind of um, soar together on updrafts. Um, they'll group together sometimes, and since they only eat carrion, they use their smell to find the rotting meat. So I'm thinking if you're down below in a park and look up and see all these vultures, maybe it's time to go take yeah, this, a shower. <laughs> this reminds me of a scene out of a Disney film. This guy's <laughs> up there having a chat and making strategies. So you wonder what smell attracted them <laughs> to where you are. This is kind of the classic uh, vulture pose on a dead tree. Hmm. But on the right is the adult with the red head. And then on the left is the juvenile that doesn't have the red head the first year. Hmm. This was a church in Irvine, and oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping it doesn't bode ill well for the for the success <laughs> of the church. Yes, all three. So the turkey vultures have huge wing area compared mm. to their weight, so they're really um, kind of tipsy because they have so much lift uh, for their body weight. So they're always kind of rocking back and forth into the wind. And this just shows that um, if you've, see a bird far away with a slight V and it's rocking back and forth, you can be pretty sure it's going to be a turkey vulture and you can impress your friends that way. <laughs> and then and you put them up in the air and they have the kind of a silver lining on the inside of their wings yeah. that actually make them look beautiful. And this would be the juvenile um, without the red head, but it has the silver secondaries and, primaries and you can see that you really need the light to see it because the wing on the left is dark but yeah it, it has that light coloring if you get them to tip enough into the light okay this is a california condor with a oh, massive yeah. wow. nine foot wingspan it's just monstrous so in 1987 there it's were like only... a 747 of birds it is. It's the biggest thing. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I think a white pelican is eight and a half feet. Even bigger. Well, th this is nine feet. So. He's, oh no! Almost as big. He's the biggest. Wow! And and in those little red marks on his wings, are those tags? Yeah, they're wing tags. 
so that you can identify them when you see them. But in um, 1987, there were only 27 in the world, and only 10 wow. were in the wild. The, wow. The 17 were in breeding programs. Boy, that's close, Russ. So when they, when the wild got down to 10, they brought them all in, and mm. then um, did this massive breeding program. What a story. So now there's over 300 in the wild mm. and 500 overall. So they've wow. done an outstanding job. So 300 in the wild and 200 still in the breeding programs. And they're mostly in California. And they've um, released some in the Grand Canyon area in Arizona. But you can look up these wing numbers. Mm. This number seven, turns out he fathered the first wild chick in the wild. And uh, <laughs> so it's kind of thrilling to wow. know a little, little bit about him. Yes. He was perched and I was kind of standing on a low hill. And he came flying towards me when I got this picture. And when he passed over me, it was like the wash of a jet almost <laughs> from this nine-foot wingspan moves a lot of air. Russ, how did you know where to go to find this guy? Well, you develop friends in photography. And a friend of mine had heard about some out near the coast. So we went there one morning and uh, we actually did find him. And there he was. Yeah. Wow. And here's number seven perched. And you mm. can see that he's got an antenna on each of the uh, wing tags. Oh, yeah. So they can keep track of where they are. Usually they lie flat against the wing, but this one sticking up so you could, mm. it's a good way to illustrate it. And this would be a juvenile uh, without the red head, but he's got the, the wing tags and the antennas. Mm. And those tags don't affect his flight, obviously. <clears throat> I don't think so. No. Okay, the next bird is in a group called Occipiters, the uh, Cooper's Hawk. And if you've ever fed birds in your backyard, you're probably familiar with this one because he'll come swooping in fast and aim for the birds that are on the feeder and usually knock them down or grab them or chase them in a bush and, and get them when they come out. But I've seen him chase a bird and it looks like he's two feet behind it and then the next blink of an eye, it's underneath this, <laughs> it's in his talons underneath his body. <laughs> so they're quite fast. Mm. But the occipiters have are slim birds with short wings and long tails, which help them maneuver um, through the trees and the brush. I went up in the go shoots um, west of Nevada at a banding station for a few days. And oh. uh, this is a an adult Cooper's hawk that they're about to band. Or, well, they did band it. You can see it. But it can raise its hackles on the back of his head and really look fierce with that um, <laughs> red-orange eye. And then this same condo I was in, um, <laughs> they had a... Uh, they built a nest about 100 feet from my back patio. So this one just got banded, and uh, he's not very happy about it. Mm, mm. But you can see the band on him, and then the Cooper's Hawk has the white on the underneath of the tail compared to the Northern Harrier that has the white on top of the tail at the base. This is how you normally see him with that short wing and long, or short wing and wide tail. Um, mm. They can just run through the trees chasing the birds, and he's taking one up to a nest there. Okay, the one place I on the green belt had this big pile of feathers, mm. and um, the Cooper's hawk will actually defeather its prey before it eats it. Ah, so these these are morning dove feathers, which would be quite a meal for it. <laughs> the other nice thing they did is that. Um, this is a rat <laughs> mm. that he took from near my house, so I was glad to see that. <laughs> That's right. But they also um, primarily catch birds. These feathers were below one of his perches where he often ate, and it cheered me greatly to <laughs> to see the crow feathers. I'm, <laughs> I'm not, a, not a fan of crows, but in a few minutes I'll show you why I think there's one good purpose for them. <laughs> he got one. So I just gathered this and put it on a mat and took a picture. Mm. 
And then after nesting was over, I'd go, I knew where a couple mm-hmm. of nests were. I'd go and collect what was underneath them. But mainly you see breast bones of birds. The feathers on the right are from a morning dove. And then some some kind of rat with a really yes. long tail up at the top. <laughs> and then a small rabbit's foot down at the bottom left. This is um, was on the ground near one of the nests. And it's actually a juvenile Cooper's hog that didn't make it. Mm. So th- he's part of the 90% that, uh, that never yeah. made it made it his first year. Didn't get very far out of the nest. Mm. So when they do make a nest, um, they bring all kinds of sticks and grass to make the nest. And you can see how wide that tail is. He's, yeah. he's trying to break and slow down as he comes up to the nest. But this just, is a, this is a good illustration of that autofocus too, Russ. I mean, look yes. at that depth of field. It is just right on the bird, and then uh, the background is blurred. Yeah, it's amazing technology. Mm. But just admire that tail. That's yes. really something. So this is my R-rated slide again, but <clears throat> it tells a story. <laughs> and for most birds of prey, they the male has to show and provide them food to the female um, before they make a nest to show that he's capable of feeding her and for 30 days while she's on the eggs and then her and the chicks as they're, they're being raised because she stays near them. So you can see the prey that she took from him ah, uh, yeah. in her talons. And then um, that's, her, that's his signal that um, she's ready to make a nest. And this was a nest... 100 feet from my house. These are two chicks that made it really easy to photograph. Mm. And here's a juvenile out of the nest. They don't have that rufous chest yet, but um, they already know how to fly and have all that beautiful feathering. And then when they're perched, um, again, they don't have the rufous, uh, but it's a darker spots. But I want you to look at the tail because we're going to look at a bird in a minute. <clears throat> the Behind outer, the branch there. Yeah, below the branch. The outer tail feathers are shorter, so if he folds the tail feathers all together, it's a nice rounded color, or a nice rounded shape. So there's a hawk extremely similar to the Cooper's hawk called the sharp shin hawk, which this is. But its outer tail feathers are the same length, so when it folds it, it's... It's kind of flat or actually has a notch in the middle. And they have kind of a smaller head. And if you get used to seeing a lot of them, you can, you can tell by looking. Mm. But here's a, a chart of the bottom is a female cooper, then the male cooper. And then above that is the female sharp shinned, and then the male sharp shinned. So you can see the male cooper and female sharp shinned are really close but again, you see the notches on the tail at the top two, and kind of a smaller head, and then the the bottom two would have rounded feathers if they were all uh, nice and neat. Hmm. And again, this is a sharp shinned in flight um, with a couple characteristics. They have that notched tail, but the sharp shin will actually bow its, its wings forward, uh, like you see. And I'm gonna show you a juvenile cooper you can tell that that's a rounded tail at the back, and its wings are straight. They're not bowed forward like the sharp shin. Okay, I'm going to switch to the falcons. <clears throat> the largest one we have locally is the peregrine falcon. It's about a three and a half foot wingspan, but with this really thick mustache. And overhead, you can see the mustache is so large that it wraps around, and you can see mm. it. But the falcons have pointed wings, and all of them are very fast. So here he is coming in for a landing and kind of a different look of spreading the tail and the wings to slow down before he lands. But the rumors about um, Mm. these falcons are that I think everybody agrees they can die of at least 100 miles an hour. (laughs) That's a dive bomber. Some people swear that they can dive bomb 200 miles an hour. But um, <laughs> wow. he doesn't have his wings tucked in, so he's not going that fast. But they will dive bomb like 
uh, the Central Park in New York City, they'll they'll just die bomb the pigeons from above, and uh, I'll show you their fist in a minute. But they'll just hit the bird and knock it out of the air, and um, probably kill it on impact. This was at the Upper Newport Bay Ecological Reserve on one of the islands that I got to go on with a um, biologist once. But this is where I'd always see the peregrine falcon sitting. It's kind of like his, his killing stump. Mm. And you can see all the blood up there, and most all those feathers and bodies down there are dowagers. So I've been standing out there um, photographing a group of shorebirds at high tide, and all of a sudden... I just hear this whoosh, and this peregrine falcon has gone horizontal. He must have started in a dive, and then he turns horizontal and just heads into this mass of shorebirds that are resting at high tide, and usually knocks one of them and, and gets them. Wow. So that's how we got the um, the dowagers usually. Mm. They have good taste. This is... Um, High-rise Newport in Newport Beach, <laughs> Newport Beach, uh, on a ledge. And right on the ledge. The elevator will take you right up, and you can take this picture through the window. But you can see he's got two bands: the normal metal one on the right, and then a, a colored numbered one on the left. And this is the other peregrine falcon of the pair, but he just has the the one on the right, but. Look at the size of the talons. Mm. And then the other one, the fist is balled up. So you imagine two of those hitting you in flight at 100 miles an hour. Uh, <laughs> if you were a slow-moving pigeon, uh, you wouldn't stand a chance. And these are two of the kids. They were successful. And then when they come out of the nest, um, they aren't black, but they're brown for the first year. But they do have that thick mustache. Okay, the next falcon down in size is the prairie falcon, um, mostly of the grasslands and deserts. And it, it will have the mustache. Um, it's a thinner one but uh, and brown. And uh, this was out in the Lancaster area. And you can see he's he has a prey there that he's eating. Another diagnostic is when they're overhead, they have these um, dark marks at the base of the wings that kind of spreads out um, from there. And you can still see the mustache from below, but it's much thinner than the, the peregrine falcon. Okay, the next size down for the falcon is the merlin. It's very compact, very fast. This is a dark morph um, that was caught up in the ghost shoots trapping area to be abandoned. This is a more typical color uh, kind of a blue-gray for the male, and primarily they just eat birds. They're so fast. And here he's about to finish off this one. And the female is lighter colored, and, and she's catching her own birds, as you can see. But I've seen them fly by in the desert, and they're just, they're just pumping their wings low to the ground, um, heading for a bird or a group of birds. The next size down is the American Kestrel. This is the male, uh, just beautiful coloring with a um, a double mustache. And they will actually kind of hover like a kite uh, looking for their prey, but mostly insects and rodents and, and small birds. So I asked him to turn around so you can <laughs> see the back of him. Again, the double nice. mustache and the the beautiful rufous color and black tip tail. Mm. That's, these are two kestrels being returned after rehab. And uh, wow. it sh shows the male and female together. Uh, you can see some of the differences in coloring. This would be the male overhead with a double mustache, but the black and white at the tip of its tail. And this would be the female uh, just kind of all that one color combination with, with the stripes on the tail. I spend a lot of time with white-tailed kites because um, mm. they had a nest nearby. And they're aptly named because they look like a kite. Uh, they'll just hover into the wind, uh, holding steady, looking for their prey down below. 
It was formerly called the black shoulder kite, which you can see in, in a few photos. But so far the white-tailed kite has stuck. <clears throat> and it turns out that our paper kites were named after the bird. Oh, really? Not vice versa. So I always thought it was backwards, but <laughs> I guess this this guy came first. So when they're hovering, when they see something, they'll um, lift their wings up so they don't have any lift anymore. You can see that black shoulder on the left and come down feet first to grab its prey. And so then they'll perch and eat it. Um, so he's going to chug a leg this down all in one piece. <laughs> and the next photo shows he's got it down just the feet are sticking out. Wow. So when you're done eating, he just wants to get his feathers back in order. So they kind of put, grab the base of the, of the shafts of their feathers and pull all the way up, and it aligns all the barbs and barbulas and hooklets to to keep it uh, all together and and stiff and strong. This is a white-tailed kite coming into a nest. So I'm kind of sitting on the ground um, with the tripod with a. Uh, camouflage net over me. Um, they would know I'm there, but I don't look um, threatening to them, so I can kind of sit there and they'll go about their business. Mm. But I kind of like to play with this with God's design. You can see how the secondaries are massively turned down, right? Um, <clears throat> which increases the lift at slower speeds mm -hmm. and also slows them down with the drag. And then he's got his talons straight down, ready to land, and the wingtips are straight out to get as much lift as he can. So I'll show you man's design. Ah. <laughs> so we call this the gas hawk. But again, the wings are out straight. Um, you can see the secondaries are bent the down. Flaps at, are down. Down at the back to <laughs> increase the lift at slow yes. speeds and slow it for the landing. And talons are down, ready to land. <laughs> talons. And I think the kite uh, has it all over in design. <laughs> but the kites are really interesting to watch. Uh, this is the male and female kind of doing a, a dance before uh, they're going to mate and, and raise kids. And again, he has to provide for the food. So the male will hang into the wind wow. with his feet down and the, the rodent in one of the, the talons, and she'll come up behind him, and they transfer food that way. Wow. So she's about to grab it with her feet, which she usually does, but this one happened to grab it with her mouth, which is kind of dangerous, <laughs> but um, they were successful. Another way that he brings food to her is he'll land on a branch when she's in the nest, and then she'll come out of the nest you can see her on the left, out of focus, about to join him. So she lands next to him, and he's saying, wait a minute, I was, this looks good. I think I was going to eat a, some of this before I give it to you. <laughs> and she says, nope, <laughs> it's mine now. <laughs> so he's going to back away, as you can see, and, and she'll take it. And if you didn't have to feed himself some other time. <laughs> So here's another R-rated slide after he shows he's a <laughs> successful hunter and, and can pro provide for her. These are two, the two chicks that came out of the nest. They're, just, <laughs> they're so easy to spot with all the roof is feathering. Mm. This is probably the older one that's um, going to leave first. He gets up there into the wind and exercises his flight muscles and builds them up. And when they come out, they just have all this beautiful coloring and, and the white tips on their wings. So these are the two that made it out of the nest, look like sweet brother and sister together because the parents are probably watching. <laughs> but if the parents are gone, it's <laughs> kind of like us. <laughs> a, yes. lot, a lot of fighting goes on and see who's king of the mountain and, and who's the best. Don't you dare touch me. <laughs> so the guy on the left seemed to have hung on even after it looked like he was going to get by it bombed. Mm. Okay, when they come out, you can see the roof is on the chest to denote a juvenile. 
So he's just out of the nest trying to learn to fly. And here comes the harassing crow. Mm. And so they're, they're going <laughs> at it between them. So the crow says, I'm going to need some more help. So he brings, ah, it, brings in his friends. The reinforcements. Yeah, to harass them. And this is where I think the crows are valuable. They help the juveniles learn to fly faster ah, and yeah. s- stronger than they might otherwise. But that's about all I can say good about crows. <laughs> so that's mom or dad in the middle there wow. with, a, with a rodent hanging down. And then the juvenile is on the left and on the right. So he has to teach him the next generation. So he's trying to teach him to, well, first you got to get out of the nest. I'm not going to feed you there forever. So in comes one of the juveniles to try and take the mouse. And looks like they got it down perfectly. And then maybe, oops, just a little <laughs> bit too much. But away they go and they tuck the mouse uh underneath and uh, go back to a branch or a nest to eat it. Okay, the next bird I'm going to show you is a northern shrike. And I'm sure there'll be birders that say, wait a minute, that's not a bird of prey. But hmm. it it does have keen eyesight. It does have a hooked bill for hmm. tearing its prey apart. But it has very weak talons and legs. But so does the turkey vulture but it's called a bird of prey. Mm. But I'll just show you how interesting they are. They don't have the strong talons, so they can't hold their prey when they eat it. So the what they learn to do is um, find thorns on a bush, and they'll. this is a, a lizard that he stuck on a bush with a thorn, and so the thorn will hold the, the prey oh. while, while he eats it. He doesn't have to hold it with his feet. Of course, man wanted to help, so they've learned that they can just hook it on a barbed wire and use that to hold them while while they go ahead and eat it. And this is a pair um, that's nesting, and looks like I think the male's on the left, the female on the right. I think she's trying to get his attention. (laughs) And he's thinking, oh, I'm busy with my own thoughts. (laughs) Leave me alone. So, and I can't hear you anyway. <laughs> so she says, well, can you hear me now? <laughs> so <laughs> they really have a, a comical way of, of getting to each other. Classic. And, and you can see his right foot there is kind of nervous, shaking, being shouted at so much. So, <laughs> yes, dear, I'll, I will go get you some food. And, and so that's the female, and he's over there on the right, and he's hmm. already taking pieces apart and, and handing it to her. So it's close enough to a bird of prey, but it's interesting how they <laughs> how they use the hooks and the and the thorns. Yes, it's like a tool. Yes. Okay, we're going to talk about the osprey, one of my favorites. Ah, yes. Uh, sometimes called a fish eagle or a fish hawk. It's got a, up to about a five foot wingspan, and it has those black patches on its wrists that make it diagnostic, with this uh, dark stripe through its head and eye. And here's the epitome of a bird of prey. Mm. Keen eyesight, mm. sharp hooked bill for tearing your prey, and certainly strong <laughs> talons for, for holding wow. down your prey while you eat it. And here's a picture of those talons. Wow, that gives you a sense of how big they are. Wow. And that's a big guy. It's, this is being released back into the bay from rehab. But besides the, the, the toenails, the, the feet are really rough and ragged so that um, when it grabs a fish, it has a better chance of it not slipping out with the scales. Now, most birds have like um, one toe in one direction and three Mm -hmm. in the other. Right. And the osprey has this unique ability that when it wants to grab a fish or land somewhere, it can spread the toes in almost 90 degrees apart to increase your chance of um, successfully landing or grabbing a fish. And they will kind of hover like a kite, um, looking for fish in the water. And when they see one, they'll just tuck oh, their wings go. down and um, head down like a, like a, I don't know, military plane. 
And then just before it hits the water, it'll thrust out its talons, spread its toes apart, and then um, grab the fish, hopefully. And they are not graceful like a bald eagle that you'll see in a minute, but they'll go completely underwater sometimes, and you can see the two wing tips. And the fish is too big. Um, he may not be able to get it up, and if he can't get his talons out, um, he'll drown, which there, oh. are, there are instances of. Cause, wow. Because the water by itself is a lot of weight plus right. the fish. Right. But here's one that gets an A plus for form. Uh, <laughs> perfect wind resistance with the head first, tail last. You can see a little blood drip down to the, to the fin down at the bottom. And this is a nest platform I built in 1993 at the right. Upper Newport Bay that was installed. It's a bigger story on another uh, YouTube video. But probably a diamond turbo. Um, he's doing a flyby to to show off mm. that, that he can catch. But you can see they decorate it with kind of like a pack rat with pretty pieces of, of plastic. Oh, and, yeah. Um, to make it interesting. <laughs> And they catch all kinds of fish at the back bay. Uh, I think this is a top smelt. I've seen needle nose, mm. uh, carp, striped mullet. Uh, is pretty popular. And so the female will feed the chicks. There's two chicks in there, uh, and the dad's at the back on the left. So she'll feed them, and they'll they'll. Uh, get close to leaving and they'll be flapping their wings to build up their muscles. You can see the some of the feathers uh, haven't finished unfurling yet. So he's getting close, but, but not yet. And then when he gets ready, he um, they jump up and down into the wind trying to get a feel for it. Sometimes a little too crazy. <laughs> but here he is out of the nest and what I like about this wow. is that all every feather is white tipped, so mm. you can see this magnificent design of an airfoil. Everything perfectly overlapped, and uh, you can just see it in the juvenile. This is a one up in the high Sierras, um, bringing in a nice trout. This is a different one. I got up above it um, with a lake behind it, but these are th three juveniles in the nest look like they're on their own, but um, mom or dad is always watching. So I want you to remember how they were up looking around, but here's mom mm. nearby and she's giving out an alarm call. Oh. And look what happens to the to the three juveniles in the nest. <laughs> they go down. <clears throat> they just, you can't even see them anymore. <laughs> so they worked this out. And uh, so there's always a parent there to protect them. So we'll do the golden eagle and finish up with the bald oh, eagle. Yeah. This is a magnificent golden eagle. It's almost mm. a seven foot wingspan. Oh my. And uh, it's got this golden nape of feathers uh, on the top of its head and, and down its neck. And it's mostly all dark underneath. Favorite food is rabbits. So I t took these out in the desert. Mm. <clears throat> this is one um, in rehab and the guy holding it is a big guy. <laughs> mm. So you can see how huge those talons are wow. uh, after he abandoned it. And th those are monster killing machines. Wow. That's a little risky for the for the guy holding the bird, right? Yeah, he doesn't have a glove on either. So <laughs> I think he's pretty good at it. Yes. Here's another golden eagle in flight. You can see the, the gold nape coming down around. But, the, but they're all dark, but the juveniles are not. This would be a juvenile. It takes four years for the white to go away um, at the base of the primaries and the base of the tail. But it's diagnostic for a, a golden eagle to have be dark and then have white in those spots. And I'll show you the bald eagle in a minute that's different. Mm. And then one interesting thing I'll show you again on the bald eagles, but... All of these secondary flight feathers are the same length. Mm. There's no sawtooth look to it. Mm. So when they're first born, they're all the same. Second year, they molt half of them. 
so they're different lengths. And then the third year, they're all the same length. So this would either be the first or the third year. Mm. And in flight, you can... Wow. They have that golden mantle that really shows off. Mm. So here's a golden eagle on a telephone pole out in the desert. And I've always wondered, I, when I see a bird, when I'm driving around, I'm thinking, oh, I hope it's a golden eagle. And often it wasn't. So I finally learned how to tell a golden eagle um, when it's on a telephone pole the body will be as thick as the telephone pole. Oh. And so that kind of, if it wasn't as as thick as that, then I knew I wasn't going to see a golden eagle. But mm. um, still, any bird out there is fun to see. And here he is leaving the post, um, going down to find the prey that he's spotted. Wow. That, that look on his face means business. <laughs> it's a fierce look. <laughs> They have really concentration, and I'll sh the bald eagle will really show that off. So I'll show you the bald eagle, mm. our, our national symbol. Yes. It's almost a seven-foot wingspan, and it, it actually takes five years to get the white head and the white tail. Mm. So I took a flight picture, cut out the background, and then <laughs> set it on top of a flag. Oh, so, so you didn't catch him flying by a, an open flag? No, the, Flag was on my hanging on my garage. So <laughs> nice touch, Russ. Would have been a long, nice touch. Long wait. So here's the picture. I I took away the background. Oh to, wow! To put it on the flag. Wow. Nicely done. Okay, here's a first year juvenile bald eagle. Um, all dark primarily. Mm -hmm. And then. Interesting ha thing happens on the second and third year, they get a white belly. Mm. So this would be a second year bird. It has the white belly. And again, if you look at the secondaries, uh, some are longer than the other. So when you go back to that first slide, it shows they're all the same length on the first year. Second year, some of them have molted and they come out shorter. So again, the the feathers on a juvenile are longer, um, I think, to help them uh, make flight easier for them. Ah. <clears throat> but it helps you diagnostic them, too. Mm. And here's another version of a second-year bald eagle. Again, you can see the different lengths of the secondaries. And again, the bald eagle has the white on the chest, and uh, on the chest, the golden eagle juvenile will only have the white at the base of the tail and out towards the base of the primaries. Mm. So it's easy to tell them apart. I seem to run into a lot of religious birds, so <laughs> this one is about to go hunting for fish. So we're praying for lots of fish, light winds, so you can see <laughs> down below the water, and uh, good, good hunting skill. So off he goes, and uh, mm. when he spots someone in the water, instead of the wings lifting him, now he's got him vertical, so the airfoil that's on top of the wing is now pulling him sideways mm. and dropping him. So it's just interesting what they go through. Aerodynamics. <clears throat> so now he's turning towards upside down, and now the wing lift is pulling him down faster than normal, mm. and he's got his talons out. And he's got his eye on the prize. He never takes it off the prize. Mm. So he will actually turn upside down. And what's amazing to me is that all this is second nature. His mm. eye never leaves mm. the fish. And he's doing all these maneuvers. He knows how to, what to do with the tail, the wings. You know, here he's folding the wings even more to, to make it faster. And then he'll start to come right side again. Again, he's, the eye is focused intently on there. And so now he's coming in, and uh, you know, I just think of his radar going full speed, calculating speed and arrival and uh, height wow. and all that stuff. And mm. you know, if you call me a bird brain, I'd say thank you. <laughs> Those are magnificent birds that can yes. do all this without yes. even thinking. 
Ah. So now he's coming in, got his eye on the fish, and got his talons out, ready to grab it. One swoop and a big wow. wing beat and doesn't even get wet. It's just, <laughs> it's classic. So I, I got a couple of eagles that like to show off. This one says, oh, look at me. I can catch one with one. <laughs> and, the other, and the other one says, oh, no, you don't. I can catch two at the same oh, time. Oh, man, look at that. So there, there was a lot of fish in that school. <laughs> so we're going to end and uh, use this as our ending as he goes away with a fish, uh, mm. just one swipe. So I just hope you really appreciate their beauty their incredible skills and their design and just uh, admire them whenever you can. And I thank you for your time and uh, look forward to talking to you again. Ah, thanks so much, Russ. That's Birds of Prey. Beautiful. Russ, uh, I, I, I've gotten to know you, and, and now in working on these projects together, I just I can really see it. I, I know you're 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 a man of faith, and I know that this exercise for you of uh, of out there hunting these birds down with your camera and capturing these magnificent images, you know, over a long period of time, a, a whole lot of varieties of birds, and you've seen them in the wild, and you've come to see how they live and exist. It really has kind of informed your faith. Can you just share a little bit about that with us? I can. Uh, you know, being out in nature, there is so much variety, so much beauty, so many species, and so much skill and adaption. It just blows me away. And, mm. Um, mm. you know, I believe in some form of evolution, maybe more towards microevolution. Mm. I have trouble thinking the pine tree and I have a common ancestor, <laughs> but um, it just it just makes me appreciate all the earthly beauty. And yes. I have a I used to work at Jet Propulsion Lab, and oh. uh, I have a photo of when they were going around the moon, and it's called Earth Sunrise. Yes, and uh, you see the the edge of the moon, and then the mm. this beautiful blue green mm. gorgeous planet just out there and I just try not to get trapped into the here and now and, and the local but you know it's just the creation is incredible and yes. I just believe in it and it gives me joy <laughs> and yes. I just you know praise God for all the beauty that he's put here for us to discover and I think he wants us to discover things and so we're still doing that with DNA and all that stuff, and it's just a journey. Uh, that's beautiful, Russ. You know, and and as I've gone through this presentation together with you, um, you, you know, when I was a little boy, I was just fascinated by aerodynamics and flight, uh, and, and 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 I studied that. I mean, I don't know that I was ten or twelve years old, but I was learning about drag and lift and <laughs> ailerons and rudders and, <laughs> uh, and you know and thrust, you know, and all those things that uh, that people had to figure out to get machines in the air you know that really fascinated me but to look at the way these birds um, respond to to uh, the, the the wind and the and the atmosphere and how they master the skies um, and soar uh, it's just a magnificent thing and that's been going on a long time way before Orville and Wilbur Wright yes I didn't know you worked for JPL. That's very cool. Yeah, I worked in the wind tunnels and the space simulators. So. Oh, man, yeah. So there you go. There you go. And it really has, I think, informed and solidified your, your faith in a, a creator who is a master designer. I have. <clears throat> People will disagree, but um, for me, that's what I believe. Nice. Thank you so much, Russ. And thank you for these beautiful pictures. My pleasure. I'm happy to share them.